Thank you. I am excited to be here this morning. I work full time. Uh, my day job is as a hospice chaplain. And uh, my nights I spend uh, teaching some online theology classes. But my, my day job as a hospice chaplain is, is a good and difficult and sacred work. Um, not only do I get to be with uh, patients at the end of their life and see kind of the beauty that can emerge there, but I also get to ruin every dinner party when the question comes up, and what do you do for work? Make everything awkward. But they really are sacred moments. Uh, I can remember a time when we had this woman who was a patient and she could barely speak. It took her about 30 seconds to get to where she could even eke out yes or no. And so I'm going, I hear that she likes uh, to sing hymns. So I go and, and we start singing the song Amazing Grace. And out of this woman who couldn't say yes or no without a lot of effort comes every single word of amazing grace. And not one note was accurate, but it was the most beautiful sound any of us had heard out of her. And you're with enough people at the end that you see the kind of peace that can come and you know that whatever it is exactly that is at the end, it's filled with love waiting for us on the other side of what we see. But in my role, I kind of, by default, bring a calming and compassionate presence in my interactions with patients and families. And so I think attempting to compliment me, one spouse of a patient once told me, gosh, every time you open your mouth, I just want to take a nap. Thank you? <laughs> Let's just say I hope that's not your experience this morning. Well, Jerry Lynn and I have been married for 18 and a half years. We met uh, just a little over 20 years ago, and we met at a college conference at a Christian camp in New Mexico. And as Christian camps are wont to do, we went to the snack bar, which was called the Chuck Wagon, and got, well, I ordered chicken tenders and fries as a snack. And I had asked, do you want to share? And Jerry Lynn said, no, I'm, I'm not feeling hungry right now. So here I am eating my chicken tenders and fries. I'm naturally a pretty easygoing guy. I have been through most of my life. So one of the questions that comes up after we had just known each other a few hours is Jerry Lynn asks me, so just tell me, what is like one of your pet peeves? And I tell her, I really hate it when people just reach over and take food off my plate without asking and making full eye contact with me. She reaches over, <laughs> grabs a French fry and puts it in her mouth. And I knew that was the woman I was going to marry. <laughs> no, it's a little more complicated than that. But Jerry Lynn crossed the line I had set up for the sake of love. And she won my heart with it. And so I want to talk with you this morning. Um, when Scott had asked me if I would preach, he said, would you share some of your story? And I will share many elements of our story with Jesus, with the church, and kind of what's brought us here and now. But I frame that story as a story of Jesus' love crossing the lines that we set up for ourselves. And Jesus crosses those lines for the sake of love. I probably should begin this message after we finish the Pharisee message by saying, hello, my name is James and I'm a Pharisee. Wow, nobody even said, hi, James. What kind of a 12-step program is this? Um, 
I spent way too much of my life drawing lines. Way too much of my life with, with the lines I would draw becoming a circle of who's in and who's out. And so as I've made those distinctions, drawn lines, determined who's in, who's out, I hope you hear today that our story is a story of God continuing to erase those lines, expand those circles until there are no lines anymore. Until no more lines divide us. I love what a monk, Lawrence Freeman, says. He says, when Christians draw lines between themselves and others, Jesus remains a relentless and scandalous crosser of those lines. He quietly slips to the other side. Whenever an attempt to imprison him is made, he disappears from sight and appears elsewhere. Thus has lived out the paradoxical nature of Christian identity. A Christian is simultaneously a member of a community and an outsider. If you've ever felt that way. It is as if Jesus still prefers to be with the outcast, however wrong their beliefs or behavior, rather than with those who are self-righteously sure that only they are right. And so what I hope you hear this morning is that Jesus loves us so much that he will cross every line there is to find us and pour out his love on us. That when we draw lines for ourselves or when others draw lines against us, we know a God who crosses lines for the sake of love. And I want to do this by sharing several of our stories, but I also want to do this in a way that incorporates the biblical story. The Bible's story is a mirror for our stories. It reflects, it echoes our own stories. And one that I want to share today is the story at the beginning of Acts chapter 11. And this story is when, for the very first time, non-Jews, the Gentiles, had come to believe in Jesus, had this amazing thing where the Holy Spirit came on them, and it's this high moment in the book of Acts where, hey, look, God is doing something brand new. And when God does something brand new, tell me if you've ever experienced this before, God's people can tend to be like, what's going on here? And so we pick up this story, Acts chapter 11. I hope that you hear echoes of your own experience and of this idea of Jesus crossing the lines for love. So it begins, Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Now, these are some pretty clear lines. The lines are drawn. There were God's chosen people, and they showed that they were chosen by circumcision. By the way, that's like why if the Bible is ever really going to be made into like a movie, it would be rated like NC-17, right? <laughs> and here are the people who are not God's chosen people, who are not circumcised. So Peter, what in the world are you doing? You are going to the people who are not God's people and you are communicating to them that God accepts them. Don't you know, Peter? It's a really clear biblical case. It says it 
really clearly in the book of Genesis and then in Exodus that you have to be circumcised. Don't you know that? What are you doing? Why would you eat with them? And so Peter is entering this world of, it's very clear where the line is. Who's in and who's out. So here's what Peter says. Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, which is important in these cases, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times. Repeat, repeat. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. So Peter is saying, like, look, I get it. Peter has a vision from God. And it takes being a kind of Peter kind of person to say to a God's voice, no way. Like, what does he think? God's testing him? No way. I'm not eating any of this. Peter, it had bacon on it. Come on. Just enjoy it. But this sheet comes down from four corners. So the whole world, this is saying, all these animals. And Peter's response is like, nope, there's the line. Again, the Bible's clear. It tells us which animals are clean, which are unclean. These are the clean ones. These are the unclean ones. God, what are you doing? You cannot make me eat this animal. And God's saying, so if I make it clean, is that okay with you, Peter? But Peter remarkably listens because he's listening to the Spirit saying, don't make a distinction between them and you. Don't make a distinction. That's critical. Peter's starting to see, okay, this line that separates them and us is the same line that God was saying is no more when it comes to clean and unclean. And so Peter goes on. He says, these six brothers also accompanied me. And we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send a Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced and they praised God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Peter plays the God card in the best possible way here, right? His answer to them is, I ate with these people because God told me to. God told me to and I listened and God showed up. These people that we said were out. These people that we had drawn a line. God loves them. And God has accepted them. 
Don't get in the way of God. Don't hinder God's work. And so we get an invitation to see ourselves in this story, to see ourselves as people who have drawn lines, as people who have had lines drawn against us. And we get to see the Jesus who crosses the lines that we set up to pour out his love on us and to say, there's no distinction. And so this passage, this message has kind of cycled on repeat in different ways through our lives. I want to invite you to think of your own stories and the way that this message cycles on repeat in your own experience. Jesus crosses the lines to show his love. And so we can come to see that we belong to each other. That each of us is a beloved child of God. That there is no distinction between us. Now, in my experience, the main problem is that there's two obstacles. And this comes up from God's people all the time. I know because I did it. That the two obstacles that come up and keep us drawing lines are lines that deal with behavior and lines that deal with theology. Right? In the one hand, you have people saying like, we can't accept that person, that's sin. And on the other, we have people saying, you can't accept that person, that's heresy. These two become the sources of judgment. They become lines by which we say, here's who's in, here's who, who's out. I don't know if you've noticed this on your end, but when I drew lines, I always happened to be in, in the lines that I drew. It was convenient that way. But every time you draw a line, you're dividing yourself from another. And love crosses those lines. So I just want to share a few stories of our own experience that hopefully help illustrate this point that Jesus crosses the lines and does so for the sake of love. So if I look at that behavior focus first, um, I can remember I grew up, my dad was a Southern Baptist minister, and so I was at church like four times a week, knew all the Sunday school stories, um, knew all the things that, you know, kind of happened, heard the, uh, the changing of the, the five loaves and two bread to feed 5,000 people like 100 times by the time I was four discovered as an elementary school kid the stories about like the fat king getting stabbed and the dagger going all the way in and all that, all that good stuff. But I can remember when I, I came to faith. I was seven years old and I remember like getting it. Like, yeah, I've, I've made mistakes. I do things that I regret. And here's this Jesus who came and gave his life for me. And so now I'm forgiven, and I get to be with God. I get my life accepted by God. And so I got baptized. I lived in Mississippi at the time. I went by GM. And I was, came up out of that water, was so pumped, and went immediately after that to like the little class that they did for people who had gotten baptized. And they hand me this book, which was like, the different things that Christians do. And I'm told, now that you believe in Jesus, here's all the things that you need to do to be right with God. And I file that story under bait and switch. <laughs> now that you believe, you had better... And so I'm an oldest child, so I did. I bettered. I bettered the place I wasn't going anymore out of everything. 
I did as much as I could. I performed. I did Bible drill. I knew everything I could backwards and forwards. I was like a good kid. Just was. Now to my brothers, I was mean. But to everybody else, I was a good kid. And so I can remember like that leading up to being about 12 years old and uh, just finished seventh grade and was asked to help lead one of the small groups that our church was sending from at that time Springfield, Missouri to do a vacation Bible school in Butte, Montana because apparently Butte needs Jesus. I've been in Montana for like over three years now. I think I can make a Butte joke now. It, it, it's, I, I think it'll land now. Okay. So I'm leading this, this group, and the whole point is to essentially like evangelize as many kids as we can. And I evangelize kids like a used car salesman. I mean, it was like, here I am 12, I have these like six and seven year old kids, and like, you know, I'm saying things like, you know what, let's just look at this little booklet and then we can go play kickball. Yeah, it's like the worst kind of evangelism there. Hostage evangelism. You can't play kickball until you talk to me. Okay, so, you know, here's this, 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 one, two, three, four. You don't want to go to hell, right? Okay, just pray with me. All right, high five. There's one. Repeat that seven times. And at the end of that week, everybody's just applauding. They're like, whoa, James led seven people to Jesus. And I, everybody's like celebrating. And inside, I felt hollow. I felt empty. Because I knew what I had done. The kid just wanted to play kickball. Let him play kickball. Jesus is in the kickball. I knew that I had not really looked at this child's faith. I had just done something to make myself look better. Now, Jerry Lynn is the opposite of me. Um, when it comes to the behavior things, she grew up in similar circles, but she's a middle child. So she asked the questions and challenged the system. So she's uh, good. She's like all heart just not about the performance. But she went to a Christian high school and the Bible class he had to take, she's taking, and one of the assignments is that you do like a devotional or a quiet time every morning and you had to report on it for a grade. And so she comes in and you know, they take the role or whatever and she says, no, I didn't do a quiet time this morning. And the teacher says, well, Jerry Lynn, this is the third time this week that you haven't done a devotional. And Jerry Lynn, without missing a beat, says, would you rather me lie about it like everybody else in the room? <laughs> Principal's office. Just kidding. But this is the problem with these lines that we draw about behavior, right? Right? The lines that we draw that have to do with behavior are just saying, well, I didn't do that, so I'm still good. There's no love in it. It's all, I'm still good. You're the one with the problem. And so I think of this quote by Father Gregory Boyle where he says, moralism has never kept us moral. It's kept us from each other. That's true. The line isn't about me becoming a better person. The line is about I'm better than you. So rather than falling into this moralism, we need a compassion and a love that crosses the lines with Jesus. Because Jesus said when he came to earth, when he lived, when he was doing ministry, he said, I'll shine a spotlight down on your hypocrisy, sure. I'll go be the friend of the tax collectors and the sinners. How's that for lines drawn for behavior?
And so we come to recognize each other. When we let these lines blur, we see each other, sometimes for the first time, that we belong to each other. That each of us is a beloved child of God and that there's no distinction between us. So Jerry Lynn would play this role in my life where she's always drawn out my heart to recognize that we belong to each other. To see the lines that we've drawn that need to be crossed for the sake of love. So after we had been married one month, I was, uh, we were, I, I was finishing up at a conservative Christian university and looking to go to um, a Southern Baptist seminary. And so we go, and now we're doing the tour and things, and the person who is taking us on the tour is asking, you know, well, where else are you looking at going to school? And so I tell him, you know, we're looking at, uh, I think, Phoenix and San Francisco at the time. And so he kind of gets this face and goes, well, I think you should probably go here because you know what kind of people live in San Francisco, right? And as I'm searching for words, Jerry Lynn, again, without missing a beat, says, the kind of people Jesus loves? Yes. Jesus crosses the lines to pour out his love on us. When we had been married only about three months at that university, there was the culmination of, of all that the Office of Spiritual Life had done on campus called Spiritual Life Week. And so they would have uh, each like fraternity or sorority house would host a different night and they'd have a speaker come and give a message. Well, like the culmination of that week was a preacher named Paul Washer. And I knew him because I had a couple of friends who... Um, were mentored by him. And so I was into it. I was excited. And so uh, we go to this event, Jerry Lynn and I, with, with a bunch of other people. And here we are. He begins his sermon by saying, I had to throw out a tape on my drive down. It said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a man like me. The song doesn't say man, it says wretch. And wretch is too good a word for us. We're worms. He left that story to say, we're so sinful, here's what it means. If my 18-month-old son had the power to do it, when he's pawing at my watch on my wrist, he would kill me in cold blood, take the watch off of my limp, cold body, and march through my blood. When we applauded at some point like that, I guess, he says, if you really believed what I'm talking about, you would be weeping and not clapping. It ended with, you don't pray a prayer to Jesus. You get on your knees and you beg him that he might have chosen you. So all in all, is a real upper of a message. Yeah, so now I'm shocked by that message. But back then, I was like young, restless, and reformed in the nicest way possible. But I was into it. Like I was tracking with it. And I was just beating the stuff out of myself, right? Like, I will do better. I will put this all together this time. I will make it work. I'll get the right theology. I'll do the right thing. I can make it work. Because I don't want to feel this guilt anymore. Well, through this message, about like 15 minutes in, Jerry Lynn had gotten up and walked out. So I'm asking her afterwards, like, well, why'd you walk out? Didn't you love that? And she's just shaking her head. No, I, I really didn't like it. I hated it. And so, as my genders want to do, I attempt to explain Here's why we like that message, right? And she just looked back at me and said, that's just not who God is. 
So I make a theological argument. That's just not who God is. So I make a biblical argument using the Greek. That's just not who God is. Jerry then goes to work the next morning at a bagel shop called Bubba's Bagels. It's in Tennessee. Everybody there, didn't you love it? No, that's just not who God is. And you know, that conviction was something that just was enough to take my view of this and go, wait a second, yeah. If I believe that God is love, and yet here I am, and God's beating the stuff out of us all the time, that doesn't seem to compute, right? And so Jerry Lynn held her ground and said, that's just not who God is. And I came to see, that's just not who God is. God is love. A line crossed. That revealed again to me that we belong to each other. That we are each of us beloved children of God and there's no distinction between us. And it'll cross every line. Jesus is not waiting on us to get better, to get our act together. He's not asking you to beg him for the privilege of serving him or something like that. No, what Jesus tells us is that God came to us to love us. God didn't leave us over here. God came to us to love us. And so the circle expands. The lines get blurred. It's like Mother Teresa says. If we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. That man, that woman, that child is my brother or my sister. And I have to tell you, that system... There's not a lot of peace in it. Because just as easily as I drew a line to put myself in and somebody else out, I can easily find myself on the other side of that line. So I always got to watch myself and see, am I still in the line? Am I still in the line? Am I still in the line? So instead, we realize we belong to each other. Now, the most painful of these stories happened about six and a half years ago. It was actually just after the last time that I preached at a church. We were at a church in Arizona that we had attended for about 12 years. I had been preaching there for about seven of those years. In that church, there was a woman, a friend of ours, who had had an affair. It had come out. Her husband knew they were working through a kind of restoration process in the church and they were friends of ours. So we were spending a lot of time with them. We were talking through what they were facing with them. Uh, we were talking with them separately. We were talking with them together. And they really seemed to trust us with a lot. We were really hoping that they would find healing, that they would find a full restoration for their marriage. They decided as a part of that process that they would go prefer to see a marriage and family therapist rather than sticking out the church's kind of process. And that was their crime. The leadership began moving against them at that point. They began feeling like, hey, if these two people are going to meet with somebody else, then we need to take steps to kind of act against them. So they, they had lost really a lot of trust with this couple. So they came to Jerry Lynn and I and said, well, you guys have been talking to them. Tell us everything that they said so that we can help them, right? And they had come to Jerry Lynn. She said, no. Not our story to share. It's not our story to share. And so we got accused of not trusting the elders. 
We were accused of, of not being willing to care enough to enter into this process with them. Um, we got this message that was like, we'll just pray that God provides the right people who will do anything it takes to love them. That led to a meeting. At this meeting, they told us that, you know, if this continues, we're going to tell the church to withdraw friendship and fellowship from this couple. And I'm not normally a quick reactor to things, but I reacted. No. No. This is not okay. This is not okay. And I start going through all the Bible stories, right? The woman caught in adultery. Forgive 70 times 7. Um, I start making theological arguments. This is not in keeping with the love of God. And as I'm doing that, I get, you know, the, the look. What is the problem that you have with the elders of this church? I just told you the problem. You're wrong. <laughs> no, you don't trust the elders of this church. And so I walk away from that meeting feeling this like weight of shame and anger. So a couple months after that meeting, the church leadership shows up at their house, tells the husband to wait outside, go into the wife and tell her, you're no longer welcome at church. You can no longer talk to anybody from the church. Nobody from the church will talk to you. There is no more friendship. There is no more fellowship. Now, she ran a small business. She was a personal trainer. Like 90% of her clientele came from the church. So she lost her business. She lost a bunch of relationships. People just didn't talk to her anymore. And she lost nearly all her hope. And Jerry Lynn and I had already decided we're, we're not going along with this. So when we were talking to them still and the, the elders of the church called us, you know, it was not a great meeting. I was not kind. But they said things like, well, we know some things that we can't tell you because we want to honor the privacy of the person who's sharing them with us. But if you knew what we knew, you would make the same decision. And I called that the item that it is. It comes from a bull. <laughs> but we were told we needed to get on board with this. If we couldn't get on board with their decision, we'd have to meet with the elders. So I told them, you know, I'm never going to support that decision. I told them that this is really spiritual abuse with the way that you're treating her. And just like that, we're no longer a part of that church. Twelve years. Twelve years. In like the greatest irony and that God has a sense of humor... The message that somebody was preaching on the next week was the woman caught in adultery and Jesus forgiving her. And so, through that time, uh, to lose a spiritual home like that, it just like disorients you so much. And so the only, the only thing, the only person who oriented us at that time was Jesus. And we came to this passage, Hebrews 13, verses 12 and 13, so often to remind us that Jesus crosses the lines and he invites you to cross the lines. And sometimes it sucks. Sometimes you lose a spiritual home. Sometimes people who are God's people don't cross the lines with you, but cast you outside the lines. And here's what that passage says. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the city gate in order to sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp 
and bear the abuse he endured. It's an invitation. So in that moment, we chose, in a strange way, to follow Jesus outside of that church, attempting to love one who had been cast out, trying to erase a line that had been drawn against her, and finding ourselves on the outs. And so it, it's, again, disorienting, it's suffering to lose a spiritual home in that way, to all of a sudden lose relationships you've invested a lot of time in. And so we just took a break from church for a long time. Uh, we, we wound up moving away from Arizona, uh, New Mexico for a bit. Um, but when we decided that we were like, okay, let's go ahead and try again, um, I feel like we tried just about every type of church that we could. And it kind of reflected like whoever I was reading at the time, I feel like. So we went to charismatic churches. We went to Bible churches. We went to community churches. We went to a Catholic church. Funny, I, we, we wound up sitting by this Franciscan sister and we introduced ourselves. And with like no prompting, at the end of the, the mass, she stands up and goes, James and Jerry Lynn Waddell want to join the Catholic church. We didn't. We went to an Orthodox church. We went to an Anglican church. We went to Methodist churches. But where we went, we were just still, it was still so raw. We were triggered by so much. And so when I took a job as a chaplain here in Missoula, we came and we decided, you know, let's, let's, let's just commit ourselves that we're going to find a church. We're going to find a community that we can call a new spiritual home. And so one of the first places that we try out, the very first line of the sermon is, bad theology sends people to hell every day. And I'm thinking like, like how does that work exactly? Like St. Peter is like drawn up some kind of exam, like, all right, to get in, can you explain the hypostatic union using Chalcedonian terms? Like what? Like what? What? What does that even mean? So we decide that's not the church for us. We go to another church and we're relaying this story to them, you know, and like, bad theology sends people to hell. What is this? Like St. Peter giving an exam and the pastor says, oh yeah, I mentored that guy. That was an awkward conversation. And so then Brooke Lennox invited us to just check out Zootown Church, told us a little bit about it. Uh, we wound up at that time on like 27 churches, different emails for our kids. So we decided just to listen to a few messages first before we like signed up for emails. So we listened and we listened to this message on hell. We listened to a message on God's love. We listened to a message on hyper grace. We listened to messages on all that the church had been through and what had been endured and this kind of stance of forgiveness that it held. And you know, for a long time, we've, been, we've thought that there's this grace reformation happening that we want to be a part of. And here's, here's something happening here. And so we found a new spiritual home. Band, you can come on up. This is a home for us where we are experiencing the same God of love. A God who is love, who is willing to cross every line for the sake of that love. Who crosses the lines, not because they're lines, but because there's you. Who's willing to go to every distance, every extent necessary to find you. And to pour out his love on you. This is a place where we've come to see that we belong to each other. 
that each of us is a beloved child of God and there's no distinction between us, that we all belong to each other. Here we see that Jesus crosses lines and Zootown crosses lines. Lines that we set up, lines that others set up against us. Jesus crosses the lines to show his love for you in every way that he possibly can, how deeply he loves you. And so when Jesus crosses those lines, and when we join Jesus in crossing those lines, we find a real freedom. And yet in that freedom, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of baggage. Because what we've come to see is that if we really all belong to each other, then in Christ, the elders of that church belong to us. If we belong to each other, then we and Paul Washer belong to each other. As Gregory Boyle says, Donald Trump belongs to us. Or I could say it a different way. Joe Biden belongs to us. We draw lines in all sorts of ways. We draw lines that separate. God offers an invitation to join him in crossing the lines and watching them erase for the sake of love. And we find this compassion, this love, this forgiveness at our table, at the communion table. Charles de Foucault says it this way, we are all children of the Most High, all of us, the poorest, the most outcast, a newborn child, a decrepit old person, the least intelligent human being, the most abject, an idiot, a fool, a sometimes sinner, the greatest sinner, the most ignorant, the last of the last, the one most physically and morally repugnant, all children of God and sons and daughters of the Most High. We should hold all human beings in high esteem. We should love all humankind, for they are all children of God. God wants his children to love one another in the same way as a loving father wants his sons and daughters to love each other. Let us love all human beings because they are our brothers and sisters. God wants us to look at them tenderly and love them just as they are. Because each is a child of God who is beloved and adored. Our Lord paid the price for their love with his blood. See, Jesus died on a cross so that every line we would use to separate us from others, to separate ourselves from God, he died on a cross to cross every one of those lines. Jesus rose from the dead to show us that nothing, not even death, can separate us from God's love for us. And so we celebrate what we rightly call communion. The uniting of many who belong to each other. Every time we take communion, we come up together and we are crossing lines, eating together, saying, you belong to me, I belong to you, no matter what differences there may be. Jesus paid the price for our love and for the love of everyone else with his blood. And so we get to love. We get to eat this meal together. We celebrate, we remember together because Jesus crossed every line to pour out his love on us, to show us that we belong to each other. We're each God's beloved child 
And so there's no distinction between some them and us. Let's celebrate communion together as we worship.